Okay, great. Uh, I want to welcome you all to our continuing Visiting Artists Lecture Series here at William Patterson, which is sponsored by the Undergraduate Art Department and the Center for New Art. Uh, as, and maybe even the dean put some money to this. I can't, can't remember, but let's just say he did. Uh, and, um, you know, we do these lectures throughout the semester. This is the last one for this year. But I really encourage you to be alert to posters and announcements in your emails for future lectures. I really believe that one of the most important things you can do is be connected to and exposed to contemporary art and contemporary thinking about art. It's more germane to the world you live in, perhaps, than some of the historical things, although the historical things are also important. Today, I would like to welcome Edward Schenken, who writes and teaches about the entwinement of art, science, and technology with a focus on interdisciplinary practices involving new media. His scholarship has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies and has been translated into six languages. Dr. Shankin thinks of his work as creating and sharing knowledge. Like Jack Burnham, who thought of art as a psychic dress rehearsal for the future, Shankin is especially interested in the way artists create working models that allow us to get a taste of alternative futures in the present. Throughout history, artists have often developed and employed emerging technologies and scientific ideas in this pursuit. By deploying technology in a metacritical way, artists offer profound insights into emerging technologies, technological modalities, and related social practices. Although many artists are superb problem solvers, many are outstanding troublemakers who identify problems and push them into a state of hypertrophy so that they cannot be ignored. Schenken believes that art, at its best, offers deep insight, a type of knowledge that Gregory Bateson likened to wisdom that can help build a more compassionate and peaceful society. He is associate professor at UC Santa Cruz, where he has served as the director of the Digital Arts and New Media MFA program. Please join me in welcoming him for his talk, Bringing to and Bringing Out, Art, Culture, and Social Media. Thank you for that generous introduction, Professor Reese. Um, it's really an honor to be here. And thank you, uh, Frida, for delicious lunch, homemade lunch before my talk, which is filling me with energy. How's everybody today? Good. You good? Yeah. The snow's done, the rain's done, at least for the moment. Um, I'm really delighted to be here, honored by the invitation. And I'm a big fan of Michael Reese's work. I've written about it for years. I've followed your career for, uh, oh gosh, since the late 80s. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, he's an extraordinary artist. And you're lucky here at William Patterson to have such a great artist and professor mentor to work with. Um, and I've met some of his students, and I see how much they admire him and how much you've done to help them and how grateful they are for that. So I really, I really admire that, too. So my talk today, Bringing to and Bringing Out Art, Culture, and Social Media. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. There we go. Um, This uh, cover slide is kind of a mashup of stuff culled from digital media, from social media. This piece up here on the right comes from a piece by an artist named Corey Archangel. Were you teaching at Oberlin when he was a student there? No? Really interesting contemporary artist working with digital media, especially video games and YouTube and other vernaculars of, of digital culture. But the quote, comes from Robert Rauschenberg. How many people know who Robert Rauschenberg is? Not so many. OK. So Robert Rauschenberg is one of the most important American artists of the 20th century. He is one of the key figures of pop art who began using the materials and discarded objects of popular culture as the content of his work. 
Um, and he was also a very important figure in trying to develop the union of art and technology. He was part of the, the found, one of the founders of a group called Experiments in Art and Technology, which has its roots in New Jersey at Bell Labs in Murray Hill. So Billy Kluver was an engineer at Bell Labs and friends with Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns and all these artists, really interested in <coughs> collaborations between artists and engineers. And so they did this amazing series of performances in 1966, over 50 years ago, where Bell Labs engineers and artists, really like top avant-garde artists in New York, like John Cage and um, Oyvin Falstrom and Robert Whit uh, Whitney and um, all sorts of great artists. Um, work together to create these technologically advanced uh, artworks. Rauschenberg did a piece that was a tennis match with a microphone attached to the tennis rackets with remote feed. I mean, this is you know, over 50 years ago where you'd have a live sort of sound of the contact of the tennis ball with, on the racket sonified through the, the, the vast performance space. It was in the the Armory, which is now the home of like the Armory Exhibition in New York. So Rauschenberg says in 1968, you can't bring two culture to people, you can only bring it out of them. So the idea behind this is not sort of the museum idea where, okay, we're going to put a bunch of culture in a museum and people can come and get it from the walls of the museum. You can't bring culture to people that way, Rauschenberg's saying, you can only bring it out of them. It's a shift in an idea where culture is a message that's sent from, you know, above and received by those below to an idea where culture comes out of the people, right? So it's more like a two-way expansive notion of culture. So this inspires this talk and gives, gives rise to its, its title. Um, and so this is by an artist, a uh, cultural worker named Crystal South, where she uses this sort of vernacular of social media. Identify yourself. You can take the art out of the internet, but can you take the internet out of art? It's like this striking parallel I discovered with the Rauschenberg quote. And then the answers are these sort of binary, like two choices, right? So how much interactivity, how much participation can you have where your options are IDK, I don't know, or LOL, laughing out loud. So this is also a critique of the notion of interactivity and agency and participation in uh, digital media, in social media, where our, our options of response are very constrained. This talk uh, began uh, at part as a Whitney Symposium talk a few years ago and it's been expanded since then. But this was a, an, a, a symposium called Shared Spaces, Social Media and Museum Structures that was trying to investigate the role of social media in museum contexts. So this uh, symposium asked this question that I thought was really interesting. How does the presence of network digital devices affect our experience of art in the museum's galleries? Uh, in what ways do these historical shifts in the mediation of our perception reflect our beliefs about the function of the museum in our society? That was the question that I was really interested in. And one of the things that really irked me about the questions was that the questions that they posed had nothing to do with the way that artists themselves use social media as an artistic medium? That's a question that I find especially interesting. So this talk will investigate that. I'm going to start, though, with uh, these questions. What is art? Who says so? Uh, where does art reside? And sort of the relationship between eyes, ears, words, and objects. Because there's an ongoing critique over 50 years about these sorts of questions. So, we could start here with Jasper Johns, the critic seeks. Jasper Johns, along with Rauschenberg, was one of the key figures of pop art in the US, a great painter. And so this is actually a piece of cast bronze. So 
I don't know how well you can see it, but we see these spectacles. But inside the spectacles, there aren't eyes. There are mouths, lips. So what do you think that means? Any ideas about what Johns is trying to convey through this, this artwork? Yeah? yeah. Oops. Uh -huh. After technology, uh, we can see only what artists showed us. We can see everything. And we can see only a selected uh, footnote from all entire object. Uh -huh. uh, what artists or technology is like after technology? Uh -huh. uh, who, what they show us. Uh -huh. the image uh huh. No, that's an interesting idea. The way I interpret this, and this is 1961, so it's it's pre-social media, it's pre-internet, um, or pre-World Wide Web anyway. What what I think Johns is trying to convey is that critics don't see with their eyes; they see with their ears. They their criticism is motivated by what other people are saying about the work, not what they actually see and interpret themselves. So this idea exists also in this quote by the Austrian aesthetician philosopher Theodore Adorno, where he writes in 1964, it is self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident anymore, not in its inner life, not in its relationship to the world, not even its right to exist. Art doesn't ex exist in a vacuum. Art is not this sort of pure thing that exists unto itself. Rather, it's, it's always and always has been in relationship to other things, other ideas, what other people have said about it, about the discourses of art. It's part of a, an unfolding discourse. Or John Baldessari, another uh, really important conceptual kind of sort of related to pop artist from LA where he did a whole series of these conceptual artworks. What is painting? What, do you sense how all the parts of a good picture are involved with each other? Not just placed side by side. Art is a creation for the eye and can only be hinted at with words. Now I take this as an ironic statement. He doesn't mean this sincerely. How could he? He's using words as the art, right? He's saying that this is, this is a false concept about what art is. That art is about what people say about it. That nothing about art um, is self-evident anymore. That it's always engaged in, imbricated in a dialogue, a discourse that is both visual and textual. And that text is visual. And that visual things are part of a, a discourse. OK. So where do art and, and culture reside? I believe that it is in a network. So given that premise, in response to the Whitney questions, as I was trying to formulate my talk, which I'm sharing with you today, I created the Whitney Shared Spaces Guest List Sweepstakes. And I asked nearly 2,000 of my Faces Close Book friends to be on my guest list, make a provocative comment, which I determined as three or more likes. Please note that your comments may be used as source material for my talk. So I asked to be on the, the two questions were the ones that I raised before. How does the presence of network digital devices affect our experience? In what ways do these shifts uh, function, uh, alt reflect our beliefs about the function of museum and society? So I got a lot of responses, a lot of responses and really interesting ones. Um, so I'll share some of that with you. So and, and then I expressed on Facebook, I didn't really like the initial responses. They just seemed sort of banal. So I. I shifted it. I, I, I pushed it a little bit. 
What irked me about them is that they don't address the way artists use social media as an integral component of their work. And then I sort of gave some ideas about this. So then I got some much more interesting responses. Um, here, art that is solely about blurring the line between actual gallery space and virtual network space will forever be renegotiating two modernist myths. Um, and then I respond, uh, citing this work here, a piece by Joshua Citarella, a New York artist. This is con uh, Compression Artifacts, and also the work of Brad Trammell we'll look at in a minute, is that it does so much more than simply interrogate the relationship between the virtual and the actual, and that it has no pretense of transcendence. So then uh, this guy Play Damage, who's uh, Kurt, what's his name? I can't remember. A really interesting artist in his own right. He says, yeah, this does, it, this does perform an in implicit institutional critique. It's much more entangled and fruitful and problematizing these things. So let me explain this piece to you for a minute. Let's not look at this. What exists, what circulates primarily, is this image of a white cube gallery space, a pristine, idealistic gallery space with these works of art um, presented in it, exhibited in it. But then, here's the big reveal. This is not a gallery space. This is a construction in the middle of a forest. It could have been done you know, just up the road in, in uh, the 180 acre arboretum, where they constructed a stage set of a gallery space. They brought the artwork in it, they lit it, they photographed it professionally, because these are you know, really good artists who know how to do that sort of thing. So it's, it's about a commentary on how we, things, how images uh, are distributed, disseminated, received, what we think of those images, we, the presumptions that we carry to them, and then revealing the artifice behind the whole thing. Not just that this is an artifice, but the white cube gallery space itself is an artifice. Okay, so let's keep going. Any questions before I... Proceed? Okay. I don't see anything on the Twitter feed yet. Okay. Oh, popular video games. Yes, there's a lot of use of um, Do you take photos from popular video games such as Fortnite and turn it into art? So I don't personally do that. I'm not an artist myself. I'm an art historian, theorist, critic. I reserve the right to make art at any moment if I'm you know, predisposed to doing so. I have made art in the past. I studied art as an undergrad and in grad school too. Um, and artists do that. There's a lot of that going on. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting area of artistic practice. Um, you might also be familiar with um, red versus blue. Yeah, red versus blue. So that's an example of, I don't know if they're artists, storytellers, whatever they are, they're using a video game platform and then repurposing it with text that's critical of the whole conflictual, you know, militaristic, aggressive, first person shooter uh, video game mentality. So it's asking like philosophical, existential questions about the meaning of life using the video game imagery and uh, environment as uh, the visual vernacular for telling these stories. Keep the questions flowing, please. OK, so art, media, and sociability between, before social media. So there's a longer history of artists using computer networking, the internet, the World Wide Web as a way, as an artistic medium. And I think it's important to understand that history and what that history, what that functions as, a sort of psychic dress rehearsal for the future, um, as a way of thinking about what artists are doing now and how that is also a psychic dress rehearsal for the future. So I'll go back to uh, one of my heroes, an artist named Roy Ascot. Uh, pioneer of cybernetic art and telematic art, telematic art being art that uses computer networking as its medium. This is a significant piece of his pioneering work of telematic art from 1983. 
an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. Uh, and this joined 11 nodes around the world, uh, connected through this really very primitive computer networking system that used you know, standard telephone lines with a rubber modem housing. You'd put like the hand piece in the rubber modem housing and it would use like these old modems where you go and it would connect to the time-sharing computer and you could only use ASCII text. There's no like JPEGs or you know sound or any of that stuff. But it joined artists in remote locations around the world to collaboratively generate what Ascot refers to as a planetary fairy tale. So they each took on different roles. The participants created a point of view of an assumed identity, the villain, the hero, the princess, the wizard. Uh, and then they played out these roles through the computer networking system. Now they didn't know the story. The story wasn't written in advance. So the story emerged as a process of this collaborative interaction of role playing, which is, you know, a very important trope in participatory media, in, you know, social and various social media contexts and in Second Life and other virtual communities. So about telematic art, Ascot wrote, and telematic artwork, uh, meaning is not created by the artist distributed through the network and received by the observer. This goes back to what I was saying about Rauschenberg and bringing culture to or bringing culture out. So meaning is the product of interaction between the observer and the system, the content of which is in a state of constant flux and endless change and transformation. It's a very different notion of art. The art isn't like some fixed object that you go and look at with a meaning embedded in it that then you have to decode and extract from. The meaning is something that you are a co-creator in establishing by, part, by participating actively in the artistic process itself. So he calls this process distributed authorship. And in, in distributed authorship, creativity is shared, authorship is distributed, but not in a way that uh, denies the individual her authenticity or power of creation. On the contrary, telematic culture amplifies the individual's capacity for creative thought and action, for more vivid and intense experience, for more uh, informed perception, by enabling her to participate in the production of a global vision uh, in, uh, through the networked interaction with other minds, other sensibilities, other sensing and thinking systems across the planet. It's a really kind of expansive notion of a collective consciousness that forms through the connection between these different minds across the world collaborating together in this process of emergent creative production. So this work, La Plissure de Texte, and people were able to do visual elements by using ASCII text to create images. Here we have some sort of castle-like form with something in the middle of it and says, uh, to the beast for breakfast. I'm not sure exactly what that means, and, but that's French. So here, again, it, it offered uh, participants an opportunity to uh, engage in collective production, role playing, and uh, sharing that are hallmarks of social media and participatory culture in the, in the mid-2000s, in the 20-teens. So this I see as a psychic dress rehearsal for the future. It allowed people in 1983 to experiment with the things that are now just sort of common reality. We do this all the time now. But in 1983, people hadn't done that before. So it was like the psychic dress rehearsal for the future, tasting the future and being able to engage with it in the present. Um, so the question I have is how can we identify what elements of current art practice will be the hallmarks of broader cultural and social configurations of the future, just as Ascot's La Plissure du Texte did that in 1983 for like 2003, 2013, 2018. What can we see in contemporary art practice that also is a harbinger of the future? Okay, so 
I'll give you some examples. Oh my God, what's happening? Shh. Oh, no, don't worry. It's just a video capture. But this is a work by a, a Dutch collaborative called Yodi. Um, the J in Dutch is a Y. And this is an example of how net art contests the museum as the privileged, authorized site of uh, authentic aesthetic experience. This is a work of net art where the artist created um, these self-downloading apps that infest your computer, okay? And what we're seeing here, this is on my desktop, okay? When I was making this talk, and I'm working on my PowerPoint, and I'm downloading these apps, and I don't know what they're going to do. Are they going to crash my machine? Am I going to lose my work? Are they going to infect it? Am I going to get some virus that's going to wipe me out for, you know, who knows how long? So I would say that OSS, this work of art, hits the user where it hurts, right on their desktop. Self-downloading apps infest your machine with potential malware and viruses. You're placed as the user in this very uncomfortable dilemma of risking installing the apps or not, exper not experiencing the work. I'm just going to turn down the, uh, the podium mic because I don't need that. And I keep banging it and making noise. So, um, yeah, you can see how this um, experience creates anxiety in a work that is fundamentally different on your own desktop than if you're in a museum context or gallery context on someone, others, someone else's computer. It's not that critical. Who cares? Okay, it'll crash their, their computer. I don't care. But when it's on your own desktop, it's like, oh my god, what's happening? Uh, here's another work that involves uh, the use of network media for collaborative uh, production. A piece by Andy Deck called Glyphiti, where you can see um, this is a video from July 2003. This is a 16 by 16 grid where users could log onto the website select a uh, square in that grid, and then reconfigure the pixels however they wanted to. As Deck writes, graffiti shifts the focus of authorship, like Ascot did with distributed authorship. It's not clear who owns the collaborative image. I encourage you to use it any way you see fit. If you don't like the options given you, please revise the source code. He made the source code available as, as freeware. Copy it, steal it, share it, print it, pretend it's yours, I don't care. Really questioning this notion of the artwork as some sort of precious object that is owned by the artist, that's made just by the artist, giving away the source code, allowing people to, you know, participate in the evolving image uh, and imagery in this work. Uh, the other piece up here. I'll show in a minute. This is a piece by Scott Draves. It's called Electric Sheep. Uh, and this uh, is, uses the sleep cycles of your computer to um, use your processing power, joining hundreds or thousands of computers together as like this massive parallel computer to render very complicated, high uh, pixel uh, animations. So people participated in this and they created their animations and they went into sort of a competition where people would vote on them and the ones that got the most votes from the community would then go on to reproduce with each other to make ever uh, more complex images that were then voted on again. So again, this is about a collaborative process where people are sharing their imagery, sharing their computing power to collectively produce images and some sort of process of aesthetic selection that parallels uh, evolution and uh, Darwinian selection, biology, genetics. So these works, like La Plissure, um, 
are fundamentally about forms of distributed production that harness the potential of networked collective creativity and computing. They question conventional conceptions of authorship, uh, objecthood, and intellectual property. It's not about ownership. In this respect, they are like fish out of water in traditional museum and gallery contexts. So, series of questions. How are artists using mobile devices and social media as an integral part of their work today? How are audiences using the same as an integral part of their experience of art and art museums? How are these emergent artistic and social practices bringing culture to and out of people and engaging them as participants in aesthetic exchanges? Um, what are the stakes of this effective digital economy? In order, what are the tensions between conventional and emergent conceptions of artworks, audiences, presentation, reception, documentation, discourse? And what's the role of the museum in this complex interplay of flows? So we'll look at a few works. If there are seats that are available, why don't we give the, the new arrivals a minute to find seats? If, Move in, find. Are there chairs in other rooms? Please feel free to go and get yourself a chair, or you're welcome to stand or sit, or, um, yeah. Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad to have such a nice crowd. Thank you to the faculty for encouraging your students to come and uh, be a part of this talk. So I have another question. What are some common mistakes artists make when using social media? Does how you title or tag your social media posts matter? I think the tagging matters greatly. You want to be able to use tags that people will find, right? And the more common tags and the more tags you use, the greater opportunities you'll have for people to actually find your stuff and relate it to other things that you think are important. Um, common mistakes, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. But maybe some of the works we'll see today will give us some insight into that and we can return to that question. Thank you for the question. Oops, sorry. So this piece here is from 2006. And what the artist did was, um, they were compiled from a question that they asked uh, of three different communities of laborers in Silicon Valley, in so San Jose. What is the fruit of your labor? And these three communities were tech workers, undocumented service workers, and outsourced call center workers. So they got a really broad array of, maybe we can dim the lights a bit. Is that better? Was that better? Oh, okay. Well, let's keep them all off. Yeah, great. That's much better. Better for you all? Yeah. All right, great. So what you see here is a big granite slab. And you wouldn't see these letters on it with the naked eye. The only way you can see the responses is to look through, in 2006, this is before the iPhone. Uh, was it before the iPhone? Yeah, I think so. Was through your uh, digital camera. And the sensitivity of the digital camera is such that it actually sees the infrared uh, illumination on the granite slab. So you get to see the answers, but only through this digital mediation. Uh, another artist, Andrew Sender, he's a painter. And so very much inspired and interested in digital media, but still using like oil on linen. Um, in 2013, he makes an image like this, where you see this highly pixelated image. There's a woman looking through a picture frame, which itself is a mediating device, right? You, when something is framed, that gives it a certain significance. That tells us, oh, well, this is a work of art, right? So she's able to look through this and maybe frame it, you know, like you see the, the, the director or the camera person going like this, like framing things. But when you look at it, again, through some sort of digital device, your phone or your camera, the image becomes much clearer. And I don't know how well you can see it there, but it's, it looks to me like kind of a, a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. 
But you can see how it's much clearer in that image on the screen than it is uh, there, or in my photograph of my screen, more, more properly. So this is the smartphone of photo. So the empty frame in the painting suggests parallels between conventional and digital forms of mediation. How many of you are familiar with this work here? OK. So um, this is a piece by your professor, Michael Reese. Uh, and this was part of a major exhibition in New York, the Museum of Design. Uh, and this was right on Broadway, right in Columbus Circle. And um, a really interesting piece that also incorporates digital media. Um, it's called Converge Grab Bag or Grab Bag from 2008. And there's this, uh, this code. And when you look on it, when you ca capture it with your device, you see an animation. In fact, it's this animation. And this reveals sort of some of the process of the work the working uh, process of Rees as he's developing a sculpture like this, which is made through a series of uh, technological processes, CNC milling, and f you know, all sorts of things, to create this really remarkable image. So what we see here is the animation at a certain moment, and he'll capture that, that moment, like just the right moment, and that becomes like the the, the, in, the uh, source material for the uh, production of the sculpture. This is, as you can see, it's a very large public sculpture. So it involves both technologically mediated processes of working, working in these 3D uh, authoring environments, creating these animations, and then using one of those animation, animated cells as the inspiration for techno technologically mediated form of production that is also highly handcrafted. So it's joining the two together. And I think partly your Reese's background as a sculptor working with traditional media, um, bridging that physicality and materiality of, uh, of work and the digital domain is one of the reasons why it's, it's so successful. This is another piece from Kansas City similar process. You see on the stadium monitor on the wall, you'd see the similar sort of animation. A, a particular frame is captured and then the work is manufactured from that. A more recent work uh, that I posted on my Facebook, uh, more recent work by Reese that involves, again, augmented uh, component where here is, instead of having a QR tag, this is actually I think the, the link. So when you capture that with the right uh, augmented reality program on your smart device, something else is revealed. Another layer of reality, of the work, of the process is revealed. Uh, another work using augmented reality and smartphones, smart devices, is uh, this piece effects city passages and tunnels that I was really honored to be able to commission for an exhibition in Copenhagen that I curated in 2013. Um, and this involves dance and the urban fabric of the city. These are the walls of the Nikolai Kirk Church in uh, Kunsthallen. Well, it's not just an art place. It's, it's an old church in the center of Copenhagen. And it uses Orasma, that's the technology. And then there are photographs that are the sort of QR tags that then reveal video that seems to be coming out of the wall or going into the wall. It's like this passage within these passages. So when I got, when this was presented, there was a dancer, a live dancer, who was extraordinary. And then, so this would be the tag, and then this is what you see on your smart device. 
and it, they used a bunch of archival footage of Danish dance, as well as footage of that same live dancer dancing in that space. So at the premiere, you had this multiple layering of the live dancer, the video of that live dancer in that same space, the archival footage of Danish dance. So this creates kind of this hybrid space that joins actual physical space and the urban fabric of the city with historical dimension of dance, contemporary dance, live dance. mediated through uh, these social media devices. Another work that works in this, this area is uh, Mark Shepard's Tactical Sound Garden, where you could sort of plant a sound garden. This took place in many cities. And so people could sort of locate sounds in certain places and you could go and listen to this sound garden on your device as you walk through these urban spaces. Here's an exhibition uh, that took place at the Portland uh, Museum of Art where the artist, or, uh, the curator, commissioned a number of artists to create artworks that responded to works in the permanent collection. So they would choose a work and then they would make a work and then you could use the QR code to use your social, social media device, your smartphone, to access the contemporary artist's response to the permanent work in the collection. And one of those responses by an artist named Artie Verkant, where he took one of, those object, uh, one of those works and then responded to it through this layered digital image. So as she writes, this call and response between the historic works and the uh, contemporary interpretations of them extends both works as a call and response. Uh, major museums have gotten into this act. The State Museum in Amsterdam, when it was closed for renovations, staged some uh, big augmented reality art events at festivals outside of the museum. They made these cards where you could sort of get a QR card and then see those works uh, in the festival space from the permanent collection. So it was a solution for enabling the museum to exhibit its collection outside of the museum when people couldn't actually go in the museum. And I think Sander Veenhoff uh, was one of the artists involved in that. We'll see his work next, other work of his. So you could not just see works, but you could actually take the work and you could locate it somewhere. So you could play a role as the curator in positioning works from the permanent collection in the festival space in an augmented way. So this is, uh, this is a mock-up. This didn't really exist here. It says, no augmented reality beyond this point, please. And this is at New York MoMA. And then the translation in Spanish and uh, German and uh, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. Um, so this was an uninvited augmented reality invasion of the Museum of Modern Art. This is an artistic intervention. The uninvited DIY, uh, DIY augmented reality art invasion exhibition. So this was by uh, Sandra Weinhoff and Mark Squarek with some other artists involved. The Museum of Modern Art caught wind of this in advance of it happening. And then they did something that many institutions don't do, but I think that's very smart. They advertised it to their whole mailing list. So they used this, they captured the energy of this artistic intervention to energize their own spaces and make that available, not just to those who were in the know, but to their whole membership list. They also created a, um, 
That's Bruce Sterling. I'll refer to him in a bit. Science fiction author and uh, cultural critic of technology. They also created a, an imaginary sixth floor to the museum. It doesn't have six floors. But they, in augmented reality, sure, why not? We'll make a sixth floor and we'll populate it with art. That it's not in the collection. There you are, looking up at the sixth floor. There's a Banksy, an augmented reality Banksy in this too. See if you can find him. There he is. Curious what you think of that sort of thing. Any feedback? If there were only a way people could look cooler looking at that stuff. Yeah. That's, Isn't that that's part of it though? Looking at all the briefs, looking at the like, oh, kind of is, yeah. Here's another augmented reality piece, another intervention by Mark Squarek, one of the collaborators on the MoMA thing. This is an intervention using augmented reality at the Whitney Biennial. So this was at the moment when there were all those floods in New York and New Jersey. And so he just sort of, uh, yeah, you see the taxi going through the flood on Madison Avenue, flood in the Whitney lobby. Okay, so now we'll go back to this guy, Artie Verkant, one of the guys who did that uh, VR, uh, AR exhibition in Portland. He wrote a really interesting essay called The Image Object Post-Internet, which is sort of a manifesto of what's become known as post-internet art. And he defines post-internet as a result of contemporary moment, inherently informed by ubiquitous authorship, the development of attention as currency, as a, as a kind of uh, commodity for exchange, or uh, it uh, uh, has value, like capital value the collapse of physical space in network culture, and the infinite reproducibility and mutability of digital materials. First, nothing is in a fixed state. Everything is anything else. You take a digital image, you can make it into anything. Michael Reese takes a digital animation, turns it into a you know, monumental sculpture. But it could also be turned into a t-shirt. It could be turned into a handbag. It could be turned into you know, a shower curtain. You can send these digital files to manufacturing companies all over the world and get something back from that same digital image. Um, yeah. So in the post-internet climate, it is assumed that the work of art lies equally in the version of the object one would encounter in a gallery museum the images and other representations disseminated through the internet and print, through media, bootleg images of the object and its representations, and variations on any of these as edited and recontextualized by any other author. And Verkant's own artistic practice is engaged with these sorts of questions. You know, you look at an image like this, I look at an image like this, I think, what the hell am I looking at? What is this? Am I looking at an installation of an artwork on a wall in a gallery space? We saw in that piece by Joshua Citarella, well, what is, what is an image? Tell us about the gallery space. Is this a gallery space that's just a, a setup in the middle of a forest? Is this a real gallery? Is this photoshopped into an image of a gallery space? I mean, if you look down here, you see some sort of like digital paint squibble that interrupts our reading of this as an actual three-dimensional space. So it's not like this is the image in a gallery space. This whole thing is an image. And this is a digital representation of whatever image he started, projected through a projector. So there's all of these layers of representation, physical instantiation, and I mean these works themselves. Like he starts with a certain image and then he'll photograph it and then he'll He'll modify it and then reinstall it somewhere 
and photograph it again. So it has all these permutational qualities. It has this set of sort of accrued, um, accrued transformations in it, including the space in which it seems to be presented in. We're never really sure where terra firma is, what we're actually looking at. It's all a question mark. So as he writes, the documentation becomes a separate work in itself. So this, is, this isn't just a work of art. It's a documentation of a work of art that then has been modified and redocumented and then modified again and then redocumented. And here is a, a certain stage in its documentation. Now, I mean, he says that this could, you know, my presentation here incorporating this work, contextualizing it here, this could be a work of art itself. It has a fluidity of existing in different states, in different forms, in different contexts. So the cultural status of objects is now influenced entirely by the attention given them, the way they are transmitted socially, and the variety of communities they come to inhabit. Because these images have wings and they can fly to uh, accidental audiences that have not read the image object post internet or come to a lecture by Edward Schenken. So Verkant says, art has long been dominated by individuals and institutions who want to control the distribution of images. This is detrimental to the overall cultural life of the object and solidify art as a hermetic system. That's what museums do. These images, you know, there's this famous quote by Stuart Brand, information wants to be free. Well, the second part of that quote that is often left out is, information wants to be free and it wants to be expensive. It wants to have wings, but you know, it also wants to be capitalized by the people who enable it to fly. So uh, museums want to lock down authority over images. They're part of their collection. They control those images, their representation, their reproduction, their distribution and most of all, the interpretation of those images. Because that's, again, going back to the very beginning, the relationship between art objects and what's said about them, and how meaning in art objects is fluid based on interpretations, and the authority that institutions have to advocate certain interpretations as valid and others as invalid. It's a very kind of dense institutional manufacturing of truth. Truth in quotation marks. Truth is something that's constructed from a certain point of view with certain investments and ideologies, belief systems, and power to control them and influence others. Verkan, on the other hand, advocates an active and immediate visual dialogue that can cross into other disciplines in real time. And I'm, I'm totally with that. So I'd mentioned uh, Brad Trammell. Brad and Artie uh, and some others, Josh Citrella and others, created a Tumblr, back when Tumblrs were really hip, called The Jogging. Uh, and they populated with, with all sorts of images. And to demonstrate sort of the fluidity of this dissemination, distribution of these images, I'll focus on some of their work. So this right here is an image that's posted on the jogging tumbler. It's called Live Strong Yellow Hot Dog Pen and Q-Tip Holder, the exquisite design you trust and the phenomenal taste you grew up with, quite limited 2012. This is, um, says buy on Etsy now. So you go to Brad Trammell's Etsy store, and there it is. The Live Strong Yellow blah, 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 for only $80. Now, OK, you can buy that. I don't know how many preservatives are in those hot dogs, how perishable this artwork is, but you could buy that. But he says it's quite limited. It's quite limited, <laughs> indeed. He's being really truthful about it. And these are other things. And I want to call your attention to these gradient stacks of uh, Dr. Bronner's soap, because we'll see something related to that. Here's his Dorito Locos Taco Master Lock Shut. <coughs> which appears in the, the magazine Dis, which is this sort of alternative, edgy, art design, fashion, culture magazine. 
And so this piece, you know, involves this, so you see the fluidity of how these images flow from one context to another context to another context. This is Bravo Gallery Girls, Angela Pham is Lulu Mon Yoga Mom holding up Doritos Loco Taco Master Lock shut during a yoga routine inside of a California forest pyre, fire part one. Typically these, these works have like extraordinarily long, lugubrious, you know, matter of fact titles that are super ironic and funny. Um, yeah, here's some other works of uh, Trammell's. And one of the things about these works is that um, these are all photoshopped, okay? These are not real things. He had a limited set of materials in his inventory. And so you see a lot of the same things over and over again. Um, Once some of those materials are used and bought by someone, then he actually makes the object and it's sold. But he only had a certain number of master locks. He only had a certain, uh, I, he, I think he could always get new Doritos, Locos, Tacos. I don't think he was holding them in, in inventory. But some of these things are really limited. And so uh, once one thing came into like being and sold, a whole bunch of them disappeared because they could no longer be made because the inventory no longer exists with which to make them. So they're all virtual objects whose existence as physical objects is determined by the market. Now I mentioned these, these gradients. We'll see the gradients here in these stacks of genes. Now I saw this image, I think, on the jogging tumbler. Does anyone know who this is? No? Okay. Well, I saw this image on jogging and I thought, what the f What am I looking at? So I recognize sort of the jogging stuff, but what's this kind of, you know, pretty, squeaky clean teenager doing, you know, with all this stuff? It doesn't make sense to me. So. I did a little research, I did a Google image search, and I discovered that this is Madison Beer, who at the time was a 14-year-old pop star protege who Justin Bieber had, had uh, tweeted about, and she was sort of an upwardly mobile proto-celebrity with a contract with Island Records as a pop star. She's way out of jogging's league. I mean, these are, you know, some artists in Queens and I don't know where they're at, Red Hook really working with edgy ideas. She's a pop star. She's like pals with Justin Bieber. Um, so again, you know, WTF. Why would Beer's people, why would Island Records and her management agree to have her do this um, modeling shoot with, with, with um, the jogging Tumblr people, with you know, Brad Trammell and others, for Dis Magazine. This is like way out of her target audience. And then I thought, well, maybe this is just Photoshop, like this works in the Etsy store. So I called up Brad Trammell. I said, Brad, what's going on with this? Because I couldn't find any Google image search that had this image in it. So he explained that a glossy French fashion magazine called Pop had commissioned Dis Magazine to do a shoot with Madison Beer. And this was going to be like a, a really feature article in their September 2013 issue. Dis subcontracted the jogging to help style the set with their kind of weird objects, like the Hidden Valley Ranch on a leash. So jogging sees the opportunity to do what they do and do what they do best which I defined as a collision of incompatible ideologies, discourses, and audiences, and, wor and uh, worldviews. These things do not make sense together. There's an extraordinary tension between them. So um, when Pop got the images, and there's a whole series of, in this fashion shoot, Pop buried it. It was not a feature. It was printed only one small image in their issue 
and the image has appeared in this magazine, the online journal, and on the jogging Tumblr. Pop Magazine issued a cease and desist order telling uh, uh, Dis to remove those images, and they ignored it. So what I'd like to suggest is that often fine art images, because I consider this a fine art image made by artists who identify themselves as fine artists, who exhibit their work in gallery museum contexts, Fine art images and ideas flow into and are assimilated by pop culture. Here a pop star, protege, minor celebrity flowed into a rarefied art and fashion culture context. And this flow is also two-way. So um, these images, so Madison Beer has her own sort of fandom, right, with tribute sites dedicated to her. And you see some of the other images in this photo shoot. Um, I think this one's particularly interesting because it has these um, night watch caps, or whatever caps they are, used as cash pose to hide like plant pots to look pretty, turned upside down. And the names on them are Manning, Ellsberg, Snowden. Like the great informants from like the the um, Pentagon Papers, Ellsberg was a whistleblower in the 70s, uh, to Snowden and Chelsea Manning in our own time. Um, so the comments and reposts of the images did cross audiences, reaching you know, uh, these accidental audiences, Beer's fandom, although this was really very minimal. These images didn't resonate widely in uh, Beer's fandom because her fans really didn't understand them either. They were also posted on the jogging Tumblr and they weren't very popular there either compared to other jogging images. And I think that this is because they um, they inhabit this sort of tension, this dissonance or conflict that is illegible by any individual audience except someone like me, okay? So um, I mentioned Bruce Sterling in the AR installation. We we'll use him as, I'll use him as a straw man to make a point. So he asked this question. Uh, what is the difference between a beautiful portrait of your spouse and a beautiful portrait of your spouse repurposed as a deodorant ad? Um, same pixels on display, so why aren't they both just as pretty? And he writes, if aesthetics could be hacked like code, and I'll return to that, that notion in a bit, then a beautiful rose and a beak of a beautiful flamingo flying in a beautiful sunset would be three times as beautiful. It isn't. It never will be. You can't make it be. That's not the way it world, the world works. So I, I, I disagree with Bruce. Because I think that aesthetics has always been hacked like code. That is the foundation of Western aesthetics. I'll give an example. Manet's Olympia, 1863, reviled at the Salon. A pasty portrait of a naked courtesan staring you straight in the eyes as her client, flanked by a black servant, delivering and admires, maybe you, magnificent bouquet of flowers, joined by a black cat with an erect tail, rendered in a style emulating Japanese woodcuts, painted as though with a drunken broom, that's a quote from 1863 by a critic who reviewed it, and shown at the official salon, is infinitely more relevant aesthetically than a beautiful portrait of your spouse. This is one of, you know, recognized as one of the great paintings of the 19th century, especially the late 19th century. Early Impressionism. And I mean, I could go on, but I could give a whole lecture just on this one image um, in relationship to these. So here we see, again, a reclining nude. But, you know, it's, she's not nude. She's an adolescent, 14-year-old model. Um, Whereas this woman here is totally self-possessed 
knows who she is, what she's doing. She's an up upwardly mobile professional woman who people are trying to charm to gain her favor. She, she has no clue what she's doing. She doesn't even know probably who Chelsea Manning is in 2014. Okay, so I would say that you know, in parallel to this description of Manny's Olympia, a portrait of a highly sexualized teen celebrity pop star unwittingly taking part in an artistic invention at odds with pop culture, modeling pet ranch dressing on a leash, or with caps bearing the names of highly publicized informants serving as cash bows, rendered with the highest fashion production values. I mean, these are like professional fashion photos censored by the commissioning publisher, but disseminated via social networks, is infinitely more relevant aesthetically than a beautiful portrait of your spouse. Or even just like a fashion photo of Madison Beer without all those accoutrements. And it always will be, you can't make it not be, that's not the way the world works, Bruce, sorry. Okay, moving on. More about the dissemination of images. This is work by Parker Ito, The Agony and the Ecstasy. I got this idea to create artworks that were undocumentable, where the content of the work was the documentation and that had multiple unique viewing experiences. So here we see like a professional staged photograph of these paintings and sculptural objects that are all covered with like this highly reflective 3M material. Now a professional photographer can control the lighting and the reflectivity, but if you take a picture with your iPhone or Android device, it looks like this. This is an unprofessional photograph documenting the same exhibition. So this work, The Agony and the Ecstasy, I argue, demands forms of interaction that are characteristic of social media. The object serves as a prop that literal, literally reacts to the contemporary impulse to photograph and share one's own images of artworks. The primacy of the object is supplanted, is, is less important than the primacy of social practices, our engagement with media, uh, producing as many varied images as possible, distributed as widely possible through as many social networks as possible, generating as many likes as possible. That's Ito's credo. Ah, that's a nice rhyme, Ito's credo. So Walter Benjamin, in a famous, famous essay from 1936 called The Work of Art in the Age of Its Mechanical Reproducibility, wrote, to an ever increasing degree, the work reproduced becomes the reproduction of a work designed for reproducing, re reproducibility. Artists know by the 30s that their work is going to be reproduced in journals and, and newspapers and things like that. So they make images that are designed to be reproduced. Well, today the same is true, but even to a greater extent and through different media. To an ever increasing degree, the work reproduced becomes the reproduction and instantaneous dissemination and recirculation of a work designed to be liked on social media. Are we running out of time? I, I hear the natives being restless. Yeah? Oh my goodness, we're not nearly there yet. But I've given you a lot. Why don't we just stop here and maybe you can ask some questions directly. Come on, be brave. Who's going to be the brave soul? Yes, please ask. Uh, can this be like a specific question in terms of like culture and like uh, about, it's about, about an art industry that I'm trying to get into a specific field. Um, um, I don't know if, I just wanted to take your your opinion out of it. Um, okay. Um, I'm, ho I'm hoping to make manga, the Japanese comic someday. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm a major in Japanese language for that. Um, a, a new standard that I found that's been going on recently in in the industry of Japanese manga back over in Japan is people are starting to use 3D models to help trace over with bodies to get production a lot more faster in, in their comics. 
um, a lot of people from the on the western side side of the planet uh, kind of frown upon this. But what what's your take on that? Uh huh. You know, it's a really interesting question. I don't know much at all about Japanese manga. So, in every industry, there is an urge to make more efficient and rapid the cycles of production. So I imagine that that will be happening in manga and automated processes and collaborative work uh, processes will emerge to make it more rapid. And the dissemination of these cultures across, you know, from Japan to the US, Latin America, Africa, we see this disseminating broadly. And what I suspect we'll see also is a hybridization of manga with other forms of cultural expression. So there's a famous work of art called A Ghost in No Shell, uh, which uses a Japanese manga character in which contemporary Western artists riff on it in different ways. I just wanted to know like, what you thought about the practice that I just brought up of using 3D mo models. Oh, it's inevitable. No, people, I mean, manga will become interactive 3D environments in video game contexts and whatever succeeds video game context. They make 2D art by tracing the model. Yeah, I think that there's like manga porn too where you can have like interactive manga porn experience. That I'm well aware of. Okay, so, so there's your answer. I mean, yeah, this is, this is the way it happens. I mean, a lot of technological innovation has occurred in the porn industry. I'm not advocating pornography, but this is just a fact of the matter. There's a lot of money to be made. The shopping cart, the online shopping cart was invented by the porn industry. Really? Yeah, there are a lot of creative people working on all things. Yes, another question. Can reproducibility in itself be an art form? Can reproducibility in itself be an art form? And I think the answer is definitely um, maybe. It depends, it depends how it's done, okay? So what we see here is an art form that embraces reproducibility, amateur reproductions and disseminations, because reproducibility isn't just reproducibility anymore. When you reproduce something on Instagram, it spreads, and then it spreads beyond your spreading and is respreaded, reblogged, and so forth. So I see that as a potential uh, form for artists to exploit and that artists are exploiting as an integral part of their work. So, yes. Yeah. Could you get people like uh, Andy Warhol and even composers like Philip Glass where they'll have repetition, is repetition art? Yeah. And damn, sometimes the answer is yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and repetition was key to minimalist art too. The same thing over and over again. Donald Judd and all that stuff. There were a couple other questions that were uh, submitted. Uh, could you define augmented reality? Um, augmented reality is uh, where you have layered on sort of the actual environment you're in an augmented image or sound or both that it adds a layer to that. Access from your tablet. Yes, yeah, from your smartphone or other device. So that's augmented reality. Another question. Yeah. A lot about the aura, yeah. the quality, the like soul of the original. Yeah. What is the soul, the aura of the original of some of these pieces? How do you explain that? Well, I think that these artists don't believe that there is a soul okay. to the work. That the soul, if there is one, is something that is emergent as a result of its reproduction and dissemination that that's where the soul is, not in the object itself. However, you could say, well, what makes one image more, more susceptible to wide reproduction dissemination? Maybe there's something in that, but maybe that's just the least common denominator. Maybe that's not a soul we're really interested in. I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting question to ponder. Other questions? Yes. Um, I came a little bit behind. Did you have anything up with like um, instead of like AR with the smartphones, AR with like visual uh, objects like the Oculus Rift? Did you cover that or no? No, I didn't. That wasn't part of this talk. Um,
But that's an interesting development and part of a long trajectory of development in virtual reality in like from the 50s or 60s. Um, funded largely by the military, the Navy funded the creation of VR headsets. A guy named Ivan Sutherland started making these things. And then his students, like Myron Kruger, who was an engineer, he became an artist, creating interactive virtual environments. And then there was this whole wave of fascination with virtual reality in the 90s. Um, and artists played an integral role in that. A guy named Dan Sandine, University of Illinois, Chicago, was part of the team that invented the cave, the cave automated virtual environment, which you sort of can exist in and move through, and as your position changes or your perspective changes, the imagery changes. Um, but that kind of died out. It seemed to be limited in its scientific applications. But now, with the advent of Oculus Rift and other related devices by other companies, and the use of uh, VR in uh, the media, like the New York Times with the Google Cardboard, and documentary, uh, uh, or, or I should say, um, what is it? Uh, journalism. Um, it's coming back in a different way. Now it's seen much more as a device for entertainment. Hence a lot of money flooding into it because they see billion dollar industries. Um, for gaming and other entertainment purposes. And artists are working with these things as well uh, in, in more or less interesting ways, depending on the artist. But it's kind of exciting to see how will this unfold? How will the, you know, the accessibility of these devices, they're not that expensive in the scheme of things, how will that create innovation in the production of, of content for these devices? Because It'll be easier to develop them. You can develop using um, basic gaming software. I forget what it's called. Um, not Infinity. Unity. Oh, I'm sorry? Unity. Unity. Yeah, so you, if you can author in Unity, you can author VR environments for these uh, VR headsets. And so a lot more people are going to be getting into that game. And this, you know, they'll be able to create stuff that will have markets because we also have app markets now that are much more fluid. So you create a great you know, VR app, you can make some change out of that. So I, I imagine there will be a lot of entrepreneurship by artists and other creatives uh, filling a void or a need for content, a desire for content in this field, in this industry. Any other questions? Can you make it quick, please? Are these questions being recorded? Yes. Are these questions being recorded? Yeah. Yes. Yes, they are being recorded. Mm -hmm. well, I like really yeah. I'm not trying to be a smart ass. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, be a smart ass. How much Pokemon Go did you play? <laughs> ah, I played none. Really? Really. Ah, well, you ain't lived. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. You mean, you mean you ain't been surveilled. Every, everybody, everybody needs to play a little bit of that. But I, uh -huh. I, I thought that was kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. No, interesting no, no. for it, this because you had so many people running around being arrested. Yeah. And everything has like semi-social phenomena. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've I, witnessed people yeah. playing Pokemon Go. I understand the concept behind it and the lure of it. It's, you know, this collective participatory experience. It has connections to Roy Ascot's ideas of telematic art and social media. And yeah, I can understand the appeal. For some reason, I've just never been a big video game, game player guy. Um, I did get into Super Mario Brothers on the, what the little hand unit. But that was mostly because I have a young, much younger hand uh, brother, second half brother, who was really into that. So I just thought, OK, well, I should. I should understand this because this is a new kind of model of learning, of like cognitive and dexterity that is a model for um, understanding how to navigate environments that I think is significant. It's a kind of a transformation of uh, consciousness or mindset that is programming young minds in particular ways. So I did want to understand that. I, I probably should have. 
spent more time playing Pokemon Go a few years ago <laughs> when it was wildly popular, but it's still going. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very yeah, it's very interesting because it's kind of like an immersive environment in real space. Yeah, yeah, and it's, uh, yeah. You know, yeah, it's really annoying because you see people doing it all right. right. Yeah, and stuff like that. But you know, it, it's, um, yeah, it said a lot. Yeah, I mean, there are artworks that that delve into that territory. There's a group called Blast Theory, based in the UK, that does artworks that blend the sort of urban fabric of a space with uh, virtual elements. And um, it's really interesting kind of unfolding story that you participate in as part of a group that's both actual and virtual. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it brings up a sort of an interesting point that you were dealing with a little bit with uh, Brad Trammell and uh, especially the teen model, Madison Beer, right? Yeah. And her images about herself, the ones that are promoting her and are connected to Justin Bieber, they continue. They flow through. People consume them. They like them. They uh, retweet them. They retumbler them, whatever, yeah. right? Whereas... Brad Trammell's image of her with ranch dressing and a collar. Now, ranch, of course, has become a huge meme with Eric Andre and all that sort of stuff. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, he's like, yo, bro, ranch! And he's drinking ranch dressing. And who watches Eric Andre? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Kids are not into Eric Andre, right? Are you into him? Yeah, right, okay. So, I mean, it's the anti-corporate talk show, you know? Um, but the point is, is that Art seems to arrest that cultural flow and mm -hmm. stop it, which in the past in museums and stuff was one of the badges of art, but yeah. now goes against the grain of digital media and the notion of flow and sharing and whatever. I wonder what you think about the fact that an image is arrested and literally dies in front of our eyes if if dying means not being further shared and disseminated, right? Right. There's a contradiction there of sorts, right? Well, maybe. I mean, Artie Verkant, for example, if we back up to um, one of these slides, um, it's it's much more about um, the versioning of the work. So the work, once it leaves Verkant's studio and is posted on the jogging Tumblr. That's not the end. It's not frozen. That's the be a new beginning. So the work signifies something very differently when it reaches an accidental audience or when it's copied and modified and reposted. And then that modified repost is copied, modified, and reposted. So I think that they see it not as concretizing something as an image, but in setting something at a certain state into a flow where then it carries on however it carries on. Right, but that, with the forget, forget that makes sense, right? Yeah. Because it, now it is flowing. Yeah. But the example of the Trammell uh -huh. with Madison Beer right. is it's arrested, not flowing. Well, it flowed, it flowed to for accidental a moment. audiences. Yeah, to yeah. accidental, but then it wasn't reshared. Yeah, but I like think the that... The least popular image on his site? Yeah. The least popular image on when their site? When I posted site. it on my Facebook, it got one like. Yeah, one like. Even yeah. in my, like, right. super enlightened cultural milieu, yeah. Yeah. no one liked it. And that's because I think that particular image is just illegible. Yeah, illegible, yeah, absolutely illegible. So someone like me, when I see an image like that, I say, what the f***? What am I looking at? This is really troubling me. I need to figure it out. And I go and I investigate it, and I try to make sense of it. And, but most people, they don't get something, you know, and it's in social media, either you get it and you comment on it, or you pass on it and you go to something else. That, immediately gives you some sort of gratification. But I mean, as you see, my use of Facebook is part of my scholarly practice. And the kind of conversations I have with, on Facebook are you know, much more philosophical and in-depth than you typically find on Facebook or especially Twitter. So I use it differently. And I think that there are different ways of using media. And um, yeah, I think that image is an anomaly. I don't think that uh, 
like I said, there are other jogging tumbler images that had much bigger wings that flew much further and you know, affected more people in different contexts. Maybe it's not that good of an image. I think there's something to the wisdom of the crowd. Hmm. Well, that's, that's worth entertaining. Um, if you remain unconvinced by my comparison with Manet's Olympia, um, I don't know what more arguments I can make. Um, but not everyone has to buy my argument. That's okay. Maybe this isn't a great image. I think it is a remarkably powerful image. I think it's extremely rich. And the layering of these contradictory elements um, is fascinating to me. But maybe they're not great images. Maybe I'm wrong. But you know, in the way, the, the Manning and, and uh, so on image is subversive, right? Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, it would be really interesting to f to if Madison Beer had actually done that image, right? That would have been the most interesting part of that. Rather than somebody taking over and using her to promote the uh, whistleblowers of sorts, if she had indeed in integrated it, right? Yeah. Or her media team had indeed integrated it as a, I mean, it's a kind of a yeah. weird strategy. It's yeah, kind yeah. of a weird, you know, I mean, it makes sense for subversive people to use pop culture icons to carry subversive messages. Right. Right? Like 90210 and Mel Chin doing that with 90210, doing mm -hmm. the backdrops uh -huh. of that whole TV show, right? That makes sense. But uh, the problem is, is that it's illegible yeah. in culture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, but that, and that's because because it's not picked up by the wis the wisdom of the look of the crowd, the popularity. Popularity does not equal intelligence. No, but it indicates a reaction. Right. But um, it, and and we're talking about a reaction in multiple audiences. This was not appreciated very much by the jogging Tumblr crowd or by the Madison fandom crowd. And to me, I find that really interesting because I see these images and I think they're absolutely fascinating and troubling and I want to understand them. And so that gives me something to work on. You know, how many, how many times do you actually encounter an image that I can, you know, talk about at such great length and contextualize in different ways, draw parallels with 150 years ago and revolutionary images that were illegible in that time. And um, I mean, I think that that's really interesting. So I still think that this is a fascinating image. It has not gained the recognition that it deserves. And, but that's what I do as an art historian. I dig up these things that I think are really amazing that no one's paying attention to say, hey, pay attention to this. This is a harbinger of the future. This is a psychic dress rehearsal for the future. This is a, a subversive act that kind of failed because it didn't reach Pop Magazine. But it also succeeded in creating these images that you know, Van Gogh sold one painting in his lifetime and it was to his brother. Where's the wisdom of the crowd there? Maybe in 20, 50 years, someone will read something that I've written about this, that I haven't written about it yet, and say, wow, that is really an amazing image. How come we didn't know about this before? Were people sleep at, asleep at the wheel in 2013? I don't know. I mean, of course I want that to happen because that affirms my prescience and my validity as a social critic, art historian, and so forth. But, you know, maybe I'm just tripping on myself. But you're also talking about, <laughs> you're, you're also referencing uh, Bruce Sterling. Yeah. And, what, and his analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Bruce Sterling. Oops, wrong way. Yeah. I think that covers it, huh? Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your questions. <laughs>